So today I'm going to talk about light scattering techniques, but mainly um, targeting their application in structural biology. Um, and the talk's divided into some basic theory about light scattering, discussions of static light scattering, um, which is going to be the main part of the talk and is probably one of the most popular techniques that we offer within the facility. Um, and a mention of dynamic light scattering and at the end, um, oh, I've got time, um, quickly review some other applications. So um, the history of light scattering has quite a close connection with the LMB, or rather um, some of the pioneers of um, um, the theories and um, mechanisms of light scattering um, started at the Cavendish um, physics lab down in, in town in Old Schools Lane, which is the birthplace of the LMB. So the first ever Cavendish professor of experimental physics was um, James Clark Maxwell. James Clark Maxwell was um, the person that Einstein referred to when saying that he was standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, so Maxwell's equations, which is what Einstein was referring to, um, showed that light um, can be described as an oscillating electric um, um, wave uh, with an orthogonal magnetic vector. Obviously, here we've just shown polarized light, so there's a single electric vector and then the magnetic oscillations. And the intensity of light, if we think about light, um, um, how much light we're getting, um, is proportional to the, the square of the amplitude of this um, electric vector. The next um, Cavendish professor of um, physics was um, John Strutt, or also known as Lord Raleigh. Um, and he um, determined that the reason why you get scattering is that the electric vector in the instant light um, induces oscillating dipoles in matter um, in, uh, where, where there are nuclei that are polarizable i.e. they can be separated and they have positive and negative charges. And so the oscillating dipoles will re-emit light at the same wavelength, the same frequency, and so-called elastic scattering, um, also known as Rayleigh scattering. Um, and uh, for polarized light, um, then the scattering is predominantly um, in a plane that's perpendicular to the instant light. The intensity of scattering um, indicates the number of these polarizable groups within, within the matter or the particles that you're studying. And um, as, a, as, as a correlation to that, um, the more polarizable is a substance, the more that substance will change the refractive index of, um, uh, or, 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 um, and this um, indicates, um, this, sorry, this refractive index change scales with concentration. So what I'm trying to say very badly is that um, the intensity of scattered light is proportional to the polarizability of the substance. And this is again, proportional to the change in refractive index per change in concentration um, that you get from that substance. So the reason why um, Measuring scattering intensity could be a very powerful technique as it gives you an indication of um, mass. That's because there are usually many dipoles in a single particle, particularly a biological polymer that we might be studying here. Um, and where these um, particles are small relative to the wavelength of light that you're using to generate scattering, then they tend to emit or they will emit light coherently while the um, scattering from different particles will be emitted in an incoherent manner. So the intensity of the light, of the scattered light, um, of the coherent light will be the square of the sum. So the square of each of the um, vector electric or the amplitude of the vectors of the light that's uh, produced. Whereas the intensity from different um, particles will be the sum of the squares. So if you just arbitrarily uh, generate how this would affect the scattering, you can see that scattering from a single particle will scale um, very strongly and non-linearly. 
with the number of polarizable nuclei that you include, whereas the individual particles will sc um, scatter in a linear manner and, and, and much less. So normally in biological work, we use uh, a wavelength um, in the in the red region, in the case of the LMB instruments, it's 658 nanometers. The reason for this is mainly to keep away from any, any absorbance that might be present in biological molecules. Um, and particles that are smaller than this wavelength um, will appear to scatter light equally in all different directions, so-called isotropic scatterance. But as particle size increases, and in the case of our instrumentation using 658 nanometers, once particles become bigger than about 10 nanometers, then you get a loss of coherence within intramolecular scattering. And this produces some measurable attenuation of the scattered intensity at a, as a function of angle. So the intensity um, across all angles um, differs. So you can see here um, for a particle that's 21 nanometers in diameter, uh, sorry, in radius, um, we have um, a loss of intensity from zero degree angle, which is transmission uh, up to 180, a loss of about 5%. So the change is not huge for that kind of a particle. Um, but once the particles become larger than 10 nanometers, we can actually measure this attenuation. And by measuring and fitting this, we can determine something called the root mean square radius, also known as the radius of duration. And that is a, a property of um, particles, which this um, radius of duration reflects the distribution of polarizable groups, which corresponds to the mass of a particle around the average center of mass. And each distribute each distance from the average center of mass is weighted by the square of the distance from this center. So this is how it's um, calculated. An easier way to think about that is if you have a hollow sphere like a ping pong ball, then the radius of duration is going to equal the physical measured radius of the, the ball. That's because all of the mass is the same distance from the center of the mass. For a solid sphere with uniform density, then the physical radius is um, larger than the radius of duration. That's because some of the mass is closer, closer to the center. And there are other relations such as for random foil polymer, then the average length of that is going to be 2.2 two and a half times the radius of duration for a rigid rod, it's even larger. Just to point out that the, the radius of duration is slightly misleading to them because there isn't really any kinetic or dynamic um, element to the measurement of it. So um, the description of this attenuation um, of scattering as a function of angle was developed by um, Gustav Mee. And um, in this, you can mod model this angular atten attenuation um, in this, in this um, description here of the um, scattering phase function. And this includes the radius of duration, the angle and the wavelength of light along with a number of other constants. So when particles are much smaller um, than the wavelength, this, this expression here, sorry, this whole expression here, tends to zero, so um, the scattering phase function equates to one. Um, and particles closer to the wavelengths of light uh, scatter predominantly in the forward direction. So this can be visualized in this um, parameter, which is two pi RG divided by wavelength, which is commonly used in this sort of scattering field, known as the size parameter. And here you can see the effect when when the size parameter is very small, you get scattering isotropically in all angles. And here, when the uh, radius of the particle is approximately equal to the wavelength of light, all of the scattering is in the forward direction. This um, is another way of thinking about the um, 
scattering as a, um, as a function of angle or as a function of this size parameter. So um, the me theory describes all scattering, obviously, um, and um, but unfortunately, it can be extremely messy and very complex in terms of the angular distribution of, uh, uh, of angle where the radius is similar to the wavelength. And this is the so-called me regime in terms of scattering. So here you have wavelengths, and here you have particle size. When the particles are small, you have enter this so-called Raleigh scattering regime, or you even have no scattering at all. And when the uh, particles are extremely large relative to the wavelength of light, everything simplifies and it becomes geometric optics um, because all the scatter is in the forward direction. Most biological work that we do here um, is conducted using uh, visible or near infrared lasers. And it's generally going on in the rally regime where things are a lot more analytically simple. Um, so we're working in, the, in this region here where um, the, the uh, size parameter is, is small relative to the wavelength of light. Just to point out an interesting phenomenon, well, a couple of interesting takeaways from this kind of a plot is when you see rain radar on the weather forecast, or if you look on the, the internet, that's using um, microwave radiation here in this kind of a, a region. The reason for that is that you send out the, the radiation and you want some of it to come back to tell you how much rain there is. So you have to be working in the rally regime. If you're in the me, me or in the, the other regions, all of the light would be carrying on in the forward direction. So uh, rain radar uses these kind of wavelengths here. So then raindrops and drizzle, you're still in the rainy scattering regime, you get backscattering. Um, and similarly, if you think about rain and rainbows, then um, in the visible region, you're in the geometric optics, that's why you're getting the uh, generation of spectrum. So um, when, when we're in a, a regime where the particles are, are fairly small relative to the wavelength of light, and for our magic wavelength, this corresponds to something like 25 nanometers down to about 0.2 nanometers, then the analytical description of scattering um, in, in, in this so-called rally regime is, is somewhat more simple. The reason for that is that this um, phase function equate, uh, becomes one. Um, here you can see this is the um, scattering that we're measuring at any particular angle. Here are a bunch of optical constants, um, including the polarizability factor, this uh, change in refractive index, a function of concentration. Um, and um, here we have the, the uh, molar mass of the particle that we're studying and the concentration. Um, and then in this expression at the end, we have um, again the um, scattering phase function, but also this uh, parameter known as the step imperial coefficient. And I'll mention that a bit later in the, in the talk. So how do we measure light scattering for our kind of applications in practice? So the instrumentation we have here at the LMB is from um, Wyatt Technology Corporation. Um, there are other manufacturers of light scattering instru instrumentation, um, but um, we have a number of these systems, one in the cold room and uh, one in, in the lab at room temperature. So they comprised of uh, different detectors. We have a, a multi-angle uh, light scattering, meaning that we can measure the intensity of scattered light over um, angle ranges between 20 degrees, 150 degree, degrees. And again, the wavelength 658. We also have um, a dish differential refractometer, and this allows you to measure the uh, refractive index increment as a function of um, concentration, giving you this polarizability factor. So we can measure this with the um, this instrument, and we can measure the dn by dc value with the refractometer. Once you know the dn dc, 
um, or in fact it may well be published anyway, um, then you can use the change in refractive index measured in this detector to give you the concentration, which is the other parameter that you need to know. So if we're trying to determine mass in solution, we need to know the polarizability factor, the concentration, and measure the intensity of scattered light. You can also use other types of concentration detectors, such as um, UV absorbance. Um, and um, as you would in uh, um, any type of chromatography or with a spectrometer. Um, and this opens up the option of measuring concentration in two different ways, one by refractive index um, and one by say UV. And this dual concentration determination can either be used as a cross check for your mass determination. For example, if you have a complex, the complex uh, will have a specific um, extinction coefficient. If you use that extinction coefficient, you should get the same um, mass as you do from the refractive index. But also it can be used in um, a method called conjugate analysis, uh, or called conjugate analysis by Wyatt's anyway. Um, and I'll talk about that again uh, in a second. So proteins tend to have um, a very universal um, refractive index increment, and this is 0.19 for one, mil, uh, one gram per milliliter solution. The reason for this is that most of the polarizability is coming from the backbone, and that's like a, obviously a universal feature of, uh, of proteins. Um, there, is, there are side chain, chain contributions, but in this paper, they looked at um, 62,000 different protein sequences simulated the refractive index increment uh, based on the individual amino acids uh, having a, no, uh, a known refractive index increment of the different side chains at the backbone. And you can see in this heat map distribution of um, um, refractive index increments is pretty small and close to this value. Um, so this also reflects that proteins are polarizable and they scatter pretty well. Um, another thing to consider is that um, because we are typically working at not gram per mil the concentrations of protein, you'll be relieved to hear, but mic per mil um, concentrations of protein, then typically we're measuring changes in refractive index around about 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 6 of a refractive index unit. Um, and this is technically quite, quite challenging because refractive index of the background solvent is going to be about 1.3. Uh, and again, just to reiterate that uh, protein concentration is, can be measured from this excess refractive index and put back into the um, uh, Rayleigh equation. And this is particularly useful if you have a protein, say, with no aromatic residues, so it has no UV absorbance. But also, um, if you don't know what the extinction coefficient is, you don't know what the sequence is, or it's some sort of complex and you don't really know what's in it, the extinction coefficient will be the same, irrespective of uh, what it is. And so the mass should be accurately determined. So um, in terms of measuring the um, light scattering as a function of angle in this instrument, we could, we could envisage doing this as a, a batch measurement where we just put the solution into the, um, a cuvette of some sort or, or pass it into the instrument through flow lines and just measure as a, a, a batch measurement. The problem with that is that um, the, there will be a, a very large contribution from low concentrations of large particles. So you might have um, many, many particles of a small protein that you're interested in studying, but a very small amount of aggregate present in the sample. And that small amount of aggregate will generate large amounts of scattering because of this large difference between the um, um, large particles and the individual particles in terms of generating their scattering. Um, so if you want to work in batch measurement, then a single uh, stable species, which is monodispersed, meaning only the small guys present and, and none of the aggregate, this would be the ideal measurement for uh, the ideal material to use in a batch measurement. 
You can get around this problem by filtering uh, the solutions with very fine membranes. And that was the way it was done um, in the past. Uh, but, but, but that's not really uh, very um, um, suitable because it's actually hiding what you might want to be finding out is, well, how much of the uh, monodispersed material do I have and how much aggregate do I have? So fractionation before measurement would actually be an optical, uh, an optimal solution. And that's exactly what we do in our very popular and common, commonly used technique, which is um, size exclusion chromatography coupled to multi-angle light scattering. And this is what you'll see in the literature known as SEC MOLS. So we couple it to a standard size exclusion column our polydispersed material um, comes through the column, the large particles pass through. It then usually goes through a UV detector, which is present in the size exclusion uh, chromatography system anyway. And then it passes into the light scattering detector, and then it passes into the refractive index detector. Um, and we end up with some sort of chromatogram like this. The green one, say, is the UV, and that would be the one you would recognize for your work on the actor. Here, the blue one is the refractive index um, trace, and the traces down here, of which there are potentially up to 18. If you remember, the um, light scattering instrument has detectors that are measuring at 18 different angles. Um, and each point in this chromatogram, so we're collecting the data, say, with one second interval or something like that, every single point can be used to give the mass and possibly the radius of duration of these particles, depending on their size, obviously for the radius of duration. So here's the typical data. And as I just said, um, you have the refractive index, the UV, and then here are your 18 light scattering angles. There's some interesting observations you can make. First of all, um, this is a, a sample of BSA run at 100 microliters of one mic per mil BSA run on a uh, Superdex 200 column. Here you can see at the column void that there is um, substantial light scattering. If you actually look at the intensity of the light scattering from this material compared to the light scattering generated by the monomeric BSA, you'll see that they're not, not dissimilar in amplitude. So this is the whole point of doing the size excluding chromatography is to remove this signal um, from what we're really interested in, which is the, the major species present. When you look at either refractive index or UV, we can't actually detect any concentration of this aggregated material. So it's present at very low levels, but it's generating large amounts of scattering. Uh, <laughs> at the other end of the chromatogram, um, you can have large changes in refractive index um, at the solvent front. And this is because the BSA that we used for this experiment was in a slightly different buffer. So what you see at the end of the experiment is sort of bits of um, differences in components of buffer and what you injected. So salt, other, other solvent contributions, which can have large changes in refractive index. So the whole experiment is quite uh, information rich. Um, and obviously what we're really interested in is what's going on here. In the, in the case of BSA, there's a monomer here and a, a dimer, and then you can see small amounts of trimer and even tetramer. How do we analyze that? So at each collection point, as I said, we can determine the mass and radius of duration. And um, these are norm normally um, analyzed using a so-called Debye plot and using a ZIM formalization. Um, these, this is provided in, in software that comes with the instrumentation. What you do, and of course, because um, light scattering is historically um, a, a, an older kind of technique, most of the analysis is, was uh, developed in terms of linearizing the, the equations. Um, to make it simple to plot out on graph paper in the, in the original or, um, you know, to linearly regress. So that's essentially what we do. So what we do is we plot something which um, is effectively the reciprocal of the, um, the intensity as a function of angle on this axis 
um, and that's plotted against um, angle uh, here uh, from the measured um, intensity. So um, what we do then is we um, evaluate the intensity on the y-axis um, at um, zero angle intercept. So we can't measure the intensity at zero angle um, because a lot of the light is passing through. Um, and therefore, um, we can fit the intensity that we get, um, extrapolate it to zero angle. And at zero angle, then um, the uh, scattering phase function becomes one anyway, because this angle becomes zero. Um, and this kind of a plot um, can be generated at each uh, um, data collection point. Um, and the masses that we get by taking the intensity here at zero angle um, and knowing everything else, the concentration and so on. Um, these masses can be um, defined in a, in a particular region, the chromatogram that you're interested in. So here you would get a mass for every single point uh, that you can see there in the UV. And then we can um, think about um, displaying those um, as a with, within the chromatogram. So the Dubai plot can also be used to give you the radius of duration, and that would be equivalent to the gradient. So this angular um, um, distribution of intensity, um, because this is reciprocal of intensity, then therefore this is lower intensity than, than here. And if you remember, you have this attenuation of um, intensity as a function of angle. Again, just to re-emphasize, it's measurable for particles that are around about 10, nan 10 nanometers or bigger. Um, there are other methods of graphing out the data. The Dubai plot is the one that we use most commonly because most proteins are um, both globular and they're fairly small, but um, relative to the wavelength of light. But there are other methods, the Berry plot um, and random coil formalisms. And these may be appropriate when particles are larger or they're known already to be non-globular. So we can display the mass that we determine at each point in the chromatogram across the chromatogram like this. Um, and um, this is the common way that you would see the data that may be uh, shown in a figure in the, in the um, literature. We can also um, average these numerical determinations of mass, um, and this can be used to give us an indication of the polydispersity or the um, const or the um, uh, level of mass across the region that we're um, averaging. So there's a parameter uh, which is just a numerical average. And that's also something called the weight averaged mass. And here are the equations that are used to calculate those um, two different averages of the masses that we determine here across the chromatogram. And you can see from this example where we have a mixture of different sizes of species. And when we average the mass using the number average or this uh, weight average, we get different numbers. For this region, reason, the uh, ratio of the weight average to the number average is, is used in the field as an index of the level of dispersity of the material. If the material is monodispersed, meaning that the particles are all of the same mass, then when you do the same averaging, you get identical numbers by any either the number average or the weight average. Therefore, the ratio is very close to one. Um, and for a monodispersed material, um, the, the ratio should indeed be one. But more commonly, you just see um, um, information about um, the levels of dispersity from, from figures in, in papers. Here, of course, we have like a monodispersed distribution of mass. So the weight to number average ratio is very close to one. And this is what polydispersed uh, material would look like. The, ra the ratio isn't one, and obviously the mass is changing a lot across the peak. This is also reflected in this 
uh, differential separation between the concentration detection and the light scattering detection. Here we have light scattering but low concentration. Here we have more concentration and lower light scattering. That means these particles are small and these ones are large. Okay, so just to show some applications that we, why, why do we do this in the LMB? Um, well, obviously we're interested in what, what is the mass of our, um, our, our sample. And this is a, a mass measured in solution. It's fairly accurate. This isn't mass spectrometry, but we would hope to get within a few percent um, of the mass. And it's fairly quick, you know, it takes 30 minutes, 45 minutes, the length of a size exclusion chromatography run. And the mass is determined in solution, and we have a pretty wide dynamic range um, that we can measure very easily. Um, important to point out, even though we're using a size exclusion column, there's no use of the elution volume. We're not interested where the material comes out at all. So there's no relationship to um, it, it behaving as a normal particle. It can, it can come anywhere in the the chromatogram and the mass is determined completely independently. So just to show you here, we're using a couple of hundred micrograms, so 100 microliters, two mit per mil, um, and the mass is determined extreme in this case, um, very accurately. Um, and uh, again, another example where fortuitously, we get very, very good agreement. Um, we can use it for a whole range of proteins. That's because we have this universal um, um, a refractive index increment. Um, and if we are using that as our concentration term, then we don't really need to know what the concentration is that we inject onto the, uh, into the experiment. In fact, we don't even need to know what the extinction coefficient of the protein is, and it could also have no aromatics. And we can also work with less than 100% pure samples because we have this size exclusion step, although we would prefer to, to measure normally uh, with, with moderately pure material um, because it's a, we're using an analytical column. Um, we can also use um, labels and tags that are fine. For in this example here, we have a, um, a molecule that, um, this is um, the dimer, it should be 28 kilodaltons as we, or 29, and we measured 28. If we have the monomer tagged to GFP, we get um, a mass again that's very close to what the expected. And then, then here is the, the dimer, the GFP on each, each of the monomers. Um, so using label material also works, so long as you don't get um, any um, excitation from the uh, wavelength we're using to interrogate the material. So we can also use um, the uh, SEC MOLS to determine um, stoichiometry where we have a complex. Um, and this applies mainly to um, situations where complexes have um, quite tight um, binding to form um, the complex because we have a chromatography run. So they have to remain associated in the complex during um, the um, size exclusion chromatography, which will tend to dilute the material. So here's an example of uh, a ribon, uh, extracellular ribonuclease, um, which is um, 12 kilodaltons. And, you know, that's what we measured here. Um, here's the um, intracellular inhibitor of this ribonuclease that the bacteria have to stop the um, ribonuclease digesting RNA inside the cell. Um, that, again, we measure fairly accurately, 10 kilodaltons. Um, and then when they form the complex, again, um, if you mix them one to one, we get complex corresponding to these two masses added together. So we can conclude like one to one complex. Just to also point out that um, this protein here, which is 12, should be running roundabout here in the column. If you run the standards on the size exclusion, this is where material should elute. Um, and this, for whatever reason, is running somewhat earlier than it should, probably meaning it has somewhat more extended shape, the uh, bar stuff. 
In fact, the complex is probably the only material that runs where it should in terms of elution volume. Here's another example of tight binding. Um, again, just a, a um, fab fragment um, and then gap. Yeah, you can see um, that we observe here a trimer and then the fab is binding to this trimer um, in, in um, one to one stoichiometry or three to three. When we have weaker interactions, then we have this problem um, that um, complexes may tend to dissociate during the chromatography. Um, and one of the things is that the sample concentration will vary across this peak. Um, because we're measuring refractive index, we can obviously convert that to give us the concentration of material during the run. Um, and if, for example, in this case, which is a coiled coil, um, you can see that when we run the material um, here at a, point, a maximum concentration of 0.6 mg per mil, and here uh, about 10 times less, you can see that um, the mass that we evaluate for the lower concentration is closer to the monomer, and the mass we get for the higher concentration is approaching that of the dimer, and it's a known um, coil coil structure. So two things to take away. First of all, we see mass distribution, uh, sorry, the mass change is a function of concentration of loaded sample. We see this asymmetric peak with a tailing edge, and we see the mass distributed following the concentration on the, um, during the, uh, the elution of the peak. And this can give us a ballpark idea of the KD, knowing the, knowing the, for the complex formation, knowing the concentrations. So SEC MOLF is not only used for proteins, we can use it for any biological polymer we might be interested in, um, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and we can look at things like um, detergents. So here's an example where we're um, looking at UDM micelles. Um, and these are run in a buffer that um, contains a background of micelles. So you inject an excess of um, detergent micelles onto a system where you're above the, above the CMC. Um, the mass um, and the hydrodynamic radius, which I'll talk about later, are very accurately determined compared, compared to the um, literature. And the reason why this could potentially be interesting is, or at least in the old days, um, when people did, still did a lot of crystallography, um, and they used detergent in the protein preparation when they were concentrating the uh, material for um, crystallography, so raising the concentration to get uh, stock for crystal um, screens, they didn't know how much of the detergent was passing through their concentration membrane. Um, and this was a way of telling them what level of detergent they had present, um, which was also important in terms of the um, crystallization process. Here's another application, which is this so-called conjugate analysis. Um, it's also referred to as dual detector analysis. Um, uh, but the uh, Wyatt guys like to call it conjugate analysis. So in this SEC MOLS experiment, we have two signals uh, which measure concentration, refractive index, but from, I mean, from the um, refractive index increment, and then UV, providing we have aromatics, we would know the extinction coefficient. We can also determine the uh, concentration. So if we have a, uh, a simple single component system, like just a protein, then the same mass should be calculated using either concentration source. And this is a useful cross-check that you can do. However, where we have um, material that comprises, for example, proteins which are modified by glycosylation or pegylation or with protein detergent, then the, the extinction coefficient of this complex um, system is the weighted sum of all components. And using the conjugate analysis, um, and the extinction coefficient for both the refractive index and the UV 
will comprise the um, extinction coefficients for the modifier and the protein. Use conjugate analysis, we can determine the mass of the protein as well as the modifier and that of the complex simultaneously. What we need to, to have to determine that is the refractive index increment for the protein. We obviously know that, that's the magic 0.19 number. Um, and, uh, but we also need to know it for the modifier. Similarly, we need to know the uh, UV extinction coefficient normally measured at 280. Here's an example of how, how we use that in this um, system. Um, so in this case, um, the sequence of this protein was 46 uh, kilodalton in size, and under a non-reducing gel, the material that eluted in red here um, from this chromatogram was consistent with this being around about um, 50 kilodaltons. However, when you look at where the material eluted, um, it was coming close to something about 200 kilodaltons in terms of the black data being the molecular weight standards. So we took this material, ran it as SEC uh, moles, and uh, what we got was a mass um, around about 60 kilodaltons, um, and the lack of concentration dependence between this high concentration run from this fraction and the lower concentration run here in black, um, we got identical masses, suggesting it could well be a monomer. Um, so applying the um, conjugate analysis. Um, so we can see that 60 kilodaltons is already, uh, the, which was the mass that we determined um, here, is already out, out with our error of 2 to 3% that we expect for mass determination. And it's too high for a simple monomer. Also, the protein is eluting a lot earlier. Um, than we expect, so it has larger hydrodynamic properties. Um, and the protein indeed has glycosylation sites and it's expressed in the eukaryotic vector. So we use UV extinction coefficient of the protein and the literature extinction coefficient for the carbohydrate and DNBC value. And then when we apply this conjugate analysis, which is an algebraic um, fitting uh, procedure, we get a mass for the protein component, and here it comes pretty close to the 46 kilodalton monomer that we expect. The mass of the modifier, which is the mass of the carbohydrate, and indeed that corresponded to the number of kind of uh, um, glycosylation sites within the sequence and the expected modifier. And then uh, this is the total mass of the um, complex. Here's another example where we use that conjugate analysis, in this case, detergent around the protein is the mass of the protein complex. It was a series of different um, subunits in a complex around about 170 kilodaltons. And in this case, because it's surrounded by detergent, the mass of the modifier was considerable uh, and much higher than the protein itself. Uh, and then again, that's total mass of the um, of the uh, complex. So quite a powerful method in giving you an insight into um, modifiers and mod um, detergent associations with your material. So I mentioned when we think about this um, analytical equation that we're using here, there's this term at the end, which includes the scattering phase function, which is normally close to one. Um, when um, particles are fairly small. But there's also this um, term here, A2, which is the second burial coefficient. So what is that and why haven't I mentioned it up to now? The second burial coefficient is described, well, is a thermodynamic property of proteins being the second virial expansion of osmotic pressure with respect to protein concentration. What that does, it doesn't really mean a great deal, but um, if A2 is positive, what that's telling you is that a proteins prefer to interact with solvent rather than with them other protein molecules if present. 
And the opposite is true for a negative value of A2. For this reason, second virial coefficient, negative values were quite, um, people became interested in them in, in, again, in the days of crystallography, because it was indicating that for a negative value, that the protein preferred to interact with itself rather than solvent. So it was on the point of um, kind of coming out of solution. And indeed, when you looked at this crystal growth, how successful they were, um, conditions of negative um, second burial coefficient gave a lot more success. You can measure it um, by looking at the concentration dependence of scattering in, in a so-called ZIM plot, which is effectively a three-dimensional divide plot. So here you've got angle, here you've got concentration. You extrapolate to zero concentration and then zero angle. Um, what if we don't know what the uh, second virial coefficient is? Well, fortunately, at concentrations that we typically use, you can see that this um, second virial term is very much um, smaller than one. So again, this whole expression here simplifies to one. Um, you can see here, if, the, if we look at something around about 0.1 mg per mil, if we inject it onto the column at one mg per mil, it's likely to end up at 0.1 mg per mil or less. And the mass of the particle is 50 kilodalton. Um, and the measured um, second burial coefficient um, is one times 10 to the minus four. Then this A2 containing term is 0 0.001. So it's one minus 0 0.001, it's effectively one. So we can kind of ignore this whole um, expression here and don't need to worry too much about second burial. Unless, of course, um, you're determined, uh, uh, determining um, um, or working on samples at very high concentration or the particles are very, uh, a very high mass, then you might need to start considering it. So now changing tack, talking about dynamic light scattering. What we've talked about so far has been static light scattering, particles are scattering light and we're basically measuring the average. We're collecting a data point every one second during our, our chromatography run. In the case of dynamic light scattering, the particles are diffusing and this causes fluctuations in the scattering intensity as particles diffuse around inside our observation volume. Um, this um, Fluctuations are averaged in our static light scattering measurement, but the frequency of the fluctuations reflects in some way the particle size, because the particle size determines how, how rapidly they will diffuse within. And this is um, analogous to fluctuation correlation spectroscopy that I think Chris may have mentioned in the talk on single molecule measurements uh, or single molecule spectroscopy. and um, but using scattered light rather than fluorescence. Um, so it's analyzed in a very similar way that you would use to analyze fluctuations in fluorescence intensity in FCS. Um, and it's done using something called an autocorrelation function. Um, and this jet looks at the fluctuations, generates uh, or takes the data and shifts it by some amount in, in the time domain and looks at the regression between the original data and the shifted data. And from this, you go from a high degree of correlation to a low degree of correlation. Um, and the time that that takes depends on um, how, how, what the frequency of the fluctuations were like. So this decay in the autocorrelation function can be late related to something that, or the translational diffusion coefficient dt. Um, and you can see this is the um, autocorrelation function, this is the offset, um, and here's translational diffusion coefficient. The translational diffusion coefficient can then be used to determine the hydrodynamic radius in the Stokes-Einstein equation. So it's important to bear in mind that um, the hydrodynamic radius is the equivalent radius of a sphere that would diffuse with the same translational diffusion coefficient of your particle 
it doesn't mean that your particle is a sphere um, and it's not in any way the physical dimension of the particle but remember with dls we're measuring translational diffusion coefficients um, and from that this um, uh, equation that's based on a perfect sphere we can get out some sort of a hydrodynamic radius so we can measure um, dls in a batch measurement here at the lmb we have two cuvette based um, instruments we also have a plate reader instrument which is very useful for sort of screening solution conditions to try and find out where your um, protein is happiest or or for other other applications such as crystallography or cryo em uh, but the problem again is batch methods are sensitive to small amounts of large particles just as the static light scattering was um, and it, the analysis where you have these large um, or potentially large or different contributions from the diffusion of, of larger particles becomes very very complex so again what we can do is just um, couple the whole thing up to size exclusion chromatography and we do this by taking one of our 18 angles which is measuring static light scattering and we replace that with a dynamic light scattering detector then we get a series uh, we get another chromatogram in our in our data again refractive index uv we've got the light scattering here and then the pink function is the um dynamic light scattering data from the uh, replaced detector so again from every single point within the chromatogram where we have sufficient signal we can get an autocorrelation function which can give us the hydrodynamic radius why is that useful um, well the hydrodynamic radius um, can give us some information um, about um, um, what, what the structure is in some way that's because proteins are usually compact globular spheres and their hydrodynamic radius therefore has a relationship to their size or the just simply the number of residues so you can see here for folded proteins in red we have this um, relationship between um, the number of residues and the hydrodynamic radius if we look at unfolded proteins um, and here you can see zoomed in at the beginning here we've got a number of um, blue points unfolded proteins then the relationship is is um, quite different um, in terms of their um, hydrodynamic radius so then when we apply that to a real life situ situation um, we can start to um, determine whether there are unfolded or par partially disordered segments because these tend to increase the hydrodynamic radius as seen here in this example for p53 protein so the p53 protein this this um, point here will be the folded uh, tetramization domain here which is just this core bit here in the middle so again a, a globular system it lies on the, the, the line relating um, size to folded protein um, and then um, we have here the full length protein so then we have the this core domain this disordered linker then the dna binding domain, uh, domain then another linker so on so you can see where we have um, constructs that include disordered regions these green points lie neither between the native nor uh, they lie somewhere between these these two functions um, we can also use measurements of hydrodynamic radius to verify translational diffusion coefficients that we measure in other instruments such as single molecule spectroscopy and that can give us an idea how to, that we can calculate in these other methods what the actual observation volume is um, you can also compare the radius of duration either measured from a structure or measured within a, a static light scattering measurement and again for compact uh, proteins they all tend to have um, a rate uh, a ratio of radius of duration divided by hydrodynamic radius is about 0.77 and this holds for most small proteins here you can see myoglobin 
So the, uh, one of the things to just try and remember is the radius of duration, just like for a solid sphere, tends to be smaller than the physical radius. I don't know, it's about three and a half nanometers. And the hydrodynamic radius is determined by how this particle will diffuse. And a sphere that would diffuse with the same properties as this myoglobin would have a radius here of 2.2. So why uh, is that interesting? Well, here's another project from the LMD. Um, we're looking at this protein, which is part of the centriola ring. Um, and it, here's the crystal structure of this shortened construct, which goes out to residues one uh, to 179. And then here is some um, SEC MOLS uh, data, um, where the construct here at the end is extended by about another 150 residues. Uh, of this potential coiled coil or whatever is happening beyond this crystal structure. Um, and you can see when we measure the radius of duration in this experiment, although it's not quite 10 nanometers, we measured it a number of times and it was pretty well determined around about nine nanometers, whereas the um, hydrodynamic radius is about five and a half nanometers. So if you take this ratio, you get 1.6 not 0.77. So already this is telling you this is not like a globular structure in solution. Um, and then if there's a plot here that shows um, how the aspect, as the aspect ratio of a protein changes, um, you get a larger and larger value of, of um, this ratio. And indeed, this was consistent with this molecule having a rod-like um, structure in solution. Finally, just two minutes, just a couple of other uses of um, light scattering or ways in which you might um, apply it. Obviously, you can determine how good your buffers are, whether they're clean or whether they've got sort of particulates in by shining a laser through. This, this is just um, scattering. This was a very popular experiment with children during the open day. Um, but just to mention, um, it should be very common knowledge. Um, but um, what we have is, um, um, first of all, the scattering intensity is very wavelength dependent. Here's our equation. And you can see on the bottom of this um, expression here, we have wavelength raised to power four. This means that the intensity of scattering for any particle will increase as we go down in lower wavelengths. And one of the problems we have is when we try and measure the concentration of our proteins, we may have small amounts of aggregate present within the sample, and these small amounts of aggregate are going to scatter very strongly. And this scattering, which is the light coming out of the cuvette and not passing through in an absorbance measurement as we would want it to, is going to give you apparent absorbance. This means that um, the absorbance you measure will be larger than um, you would ex than is coming from the majority of the protein, because some of it is coming from the small amount of aggregate. Um, and what you can do is think that the um, when we look at the aromatics in proteins which are generating UV absorbance, and normally we measure at 280, the absorbance they have stops around about 320, so they're not contributing any absorbance. So if we actually measure the spectrum between a longer wavelength, normally we go out to 500 nanometers or something, right down through the 280 absorbance. Um, what we can do is because the scatter that we're trying to correct for is, is one over the wavelength raised to some power, um, if we do a log plot, then we can linearize this. So what this allows us to do is to extrapolate to 280 nanometers. This is then the contribution coming from scattering, and this is the um, actual total absorbance. And the difference is coming from the protein that we're interested in. So you should always correct the value for the, to get the true protein concentration. And if you get large uh, values of correction, it's indicating something is not quite right solutions are not very happy. Scattering also, um, what we're saying is in an absorbance mode, or you can measure it in a right angle mode in a perimeter here, the scattering will tend to reduce the amount of light that you get. 
But what you can also do in right angle mode is just measure the amount of scattering in a batch mode in a, in a conventional curvette. And here's just an example of filament polymerization kinetics. You can see you get very large changes, very easy to measure. You can add things into the curvette. Um, you can see lag phases, um, growth phases, um, and you can you know add other components and increase the rate. So, you know, potentially quite a powerful method if you're looking at um, a system such as that. Just to mention that we shouldn't forget that in, um, we have another technique which Chris will have mentioned in the single molecule technique, which is this ice gap, um, which is a scattering technique where you look at um, scattering in the direction of the instant beam. There's also small angle, angle X-ray scattering, X-ray diffraction, et cetera, et cetera. These are all kind of scattering based methods. So just to summarize um, from moles and uh, the size exclusion chromatography coupled with moles and also with DLS, we can get a mass in solution. This is accurate, can be a few percent and determined fa fairly rapidly um, in a model free method. So it's shape and conformation independent, no reference to the elution volume. We have a wide dynamic range. We can get this uh, radius of duration, mass averaged radius for particles which are on the larger side for proteins. But, you know, obviously um, liposomes, these are cause detergent, micelles, et cetera. These numbers of rate RG can be determined very accurately. We can get the second burial coefficient if we're interested, but normally it's, it's, not, it's not something that we need to be too concerned about. And we can get the hydrodynamic radius. Um, and um, this, it comes from the translational diffusion coefficient um, and gives us a radius, which is based around a model for a sphere. Again, we have a very large dynamic range um, and comparisons of this radius of duration with ra hydrodynamic radius can give us some um, soft information about um, conformation, being sphere, rod, branched, etc. The measurements are solution based, which is very important. Um, so it's not on a grid, it's not in a crystal, it's actually in solution. It's quick, it's automated, and it's very easy to use and easy for people to get trained in. So any further advice, discussions, just come and see us um, in the biophysics facility, or you can ask your questions now. Great. Well, thanks for coming.